Okay, so today we're going to talk about the expenditure process. As we talk about these processes, I'll also incorporate things that would affect the processes, like non-mandatory rules that the districts may have or may not have, or account filters and tie it in all together as we create each of these processes. So on this next slide, these are the steps in the expenditure process that we're gonna be reviewing, but just in general, the first step is really to get that authorization to spend the money. And that comes from the treasurer creating the budget and getting the budget approved by the auditors, the board, and the appropriate authorities. Amanda did a session that's the link here <clears throat> goes to that recording, but you can also find it on that meetings and trainings page. under that date of February 16th. So the recording link for the budgeting options would be here. So we're not gonna be talking about the budgeting step, but we are on the rest of the steps. The requisition is, well, once you have your budget approved, the district can start to request to spend the monies on supplies or services. And the request is actually the requisition. So the requisition is actually the, um, the request for the goods. And then the next step would be getting the treasurer's approval that there are funds to cover that request or that requisition. And on the purchase order itself, the treasurer has their signature on it, which certifies such that that the funds are there. And then once, once the goods and services are received and the AP invoice um, is received from the vendor, that confirms the receipt of the goods or services. And then the district can prepare the payables as well as preparing the disbursement. And we'll step through all of these. So in general, or some general facts about a requisition, the processing in USAS is actually controlled by a number of variables, including users' roles. And I'm just going to go into this system. So depending on the user's roles, they'll have different permissions with requisitions. Most of today, I'm going to be logged in as admin, so we'll be able to see everything. At one point, we will... Um, set up an account filter because that's another variable and log in as a cafe secretary to show you how that scenario would look. So right now, under system rules, roles, and actually I meant to go into the documentation because here are the standard roles, for example, the USAS rec role, but down below you have different permissions that you can either create a, a new role to include those permissions or exclude and down below is the, the different permissions. Now, besides the roles, the rules of the district can also vary amongst the districts. So there is another variable that affects the processing of a requisition and actually all these processes that we talk about. And I'm only gonna go into depth about like these rules and account filters like on this requisition, but it applies to the other processes too. So once you get under the rules, you see mandatory rules and you have rules that are not mandatory. Those are the um, ones that could vary between the districts as well as these custom rules, which you can see there are several. Require a vendor when creating a requisition. Um, prevent a rec requisition from being saved or updated when the descriptions are empty. So the mandatory rules 
And again, this is going to apply to like disbursements that we talk about later, invoices that we talk about later. And again, these are all mandatory purchase orders. But what we're looking for is the requisition. And you notice they're highlighted. So you're going to get an error because it's a mandatory rule that you cannot, the user or you cannot change um, if it's an invalid requisition number. As well as the quantity must match the sum of the charge quantities and some of the other ones. But the non-mandatory rules, again, there's different ones for disbursements that you can, sorry for scrolling. There's quite a few for requisitions. You can prevent um, backdating a requisition and create an error for the user. You can prevent a requisition in a closed period from being deleted and so forth. And what you would do is well, we'll go into one of these. Require a vendor when creating a requisition. Under the system utilities system, sorry, rules, you would click create and you get this pop-up. So this pop-up, I'm going to move it out of the way, which that's a feature throughout the system too, in many pop-ups. Uh, there we go. Sorry. Okay. So what you would do, I can get over here. This name, oh, this is not working, sorry. Let me just go to the page. See this, you get the name, the description, and then the text. That's all provided on those custom rules. So if you were gonna require, uh, create this rule to require an account entered for each requisition line. Here's your name that you would copy and paste, the description, copy and paste, and then your text. And then once you're in, once you got that created, you got to remember to activate the rules so that they become active. Now you can uh, sort on this if you need mandatory, true or false, enable true or false, and so forth. So I just wanted to show you how the different custom rules and non-mandatory rules can affect the processing as well. Another thing that can affect it is account filters on the users. So let me go under this is the utilities account filters and take a look. And this is helpful like, um, Well, let me show you what we see here. You can create, search, edit, and delete. But what I want to, uh, I got lost in my notes, I'm sorry. Account filters can help the districts limit what the user can see. So for example, if I go under the cafe secretary, I want the secretary to only be able to enter requisitions with the prefix cafe and only see those accounts related to the cafe as well as only use those accounts to create a requisition. So looking at this account filter, it is active. You can also clone. Amanda talked about the transaction indicator yesterday. The O2s are the budgets or the expenditure accounts. And we want to limit to the, the fund 006. Now the first two lines are salaries and benefits. And you see there's no access granted. We don't want them posting requisitions to salaries or benefits. The other two lines does give this user permission to post to purchase services, which are the 400 object codes or the supplies for the cafeteria 
which are the 500 object codes. And over here, you can see the access granted. And I'm just going to um, edit it so that I can show you the hovering tips. So as you hover, you also get these tips. The C check mark is create, read, update, D is for delete, pre-encumbrance, which is for requisition processing because it's it's not encumbered on the account until it is a purchase order in most cases. And we'll talk about another variable in that in a few moments. And then the E is for encumbrance and that is for um, purchase orders to be able to see those. So where is that applied? It's on the user. So let's take a look quick at the user. And again, we're gonna look at that cafe secretary. In this system, it's just, that's their name, cafe secretary. They have the role, here's the role, um, USAS requisition. The filters are applied here, and we chose Cafe Secretary that we just set up. Now this section, I have the requisition approval workflow set up in this demo instance. Most of the time, well, some districts have that enabled, some don't. In this case, I do. So you will see the selectable group chains um, if it's not enabled, you won't see the menu option here and you won't see this. But this is saying this cafe secretary can submit um, requisitions to the group chain of food service. The prefix, remember I said we wanted this, cafe, this user to only use requisitions with the prefix cafe. So that is where you would enter that. We'll talk about how that's created um, momentarily. This is, uh, you can check this to only be allowed to see the requisitions with the cafe, which is what we wanted to do. By unchecking that though, um, you would see um, other users that have entered cafe requisitions. So say Paige is somebody else in the cafe department, Paige and the cafe secretary could enter requisitions. By unrestricting that, they the cafe secretary could see all requisitions with cafe. Oops. And then some of these other balance checkings and two-factor external. So that's what I wanted to show you, the variables that could happen on the user as well. Any questions on that? The requisition process is now tracked on the audit report and I do have an example of that. So, First, we added the requisition and the items. This is CAFE 009, and it goes through the process. And then it is converted to a purchase order where you can see the source, CAFE 009. So now the process is um, tracked on the audit report, including workflow approvals if the district is utilizing that. Okay. We're not gonna, again, we're not gonna talk about the workflow approval uh, process. We will be doing a session at the OECN United Conference and we'll, we will post that PowerPoint under the probably those other trainings on our website after the training next week, just so you know. Okay, so yesterday, Amanda talked about accounts and normally when you have a requisition, the monies are not 
encumbered on the account. And I guess I meant to look, go to an account or I'll go to this example. Uh-oh. Sorry if the, your screen went blank, because mine did. All right, so if you have the pre-encumbrance module enabled, and we do not, it's a plus and it's over here, not installed, that would be, that would show differently on the accounts than if it wasn't enabled. If it was enabled, the amounts for open requisitions will be tracked on the account, like Amanda said. So let me show you this. This is when the pre-encumbrance modules offer this account. You can see that it's not tracked on the account. The remaining balance is 1,155. If the pre-encumbrance module was on and you did have requisitions out there but not approved or converted, then it still tracks with this module on, it still tracks it on the account. So in that district, the remaining balance for that account is 435. Now remember that 720, because we're gonna, I'll show you how you can look for those later. Like what are those requisitions that add up to 720? So with the module on, you'll not only have that requisition amount filled in, but you could also have, this is below the screenshot, you, if you had any future year requisitions, like 7-1-2024, those would be tracked on the account as well. In this case, there are none. Okay. So let's go to the requisition grid. Those are all the variables that could affect processes and requisitions in particular. The requisition grid is where the user can select their options to print or convert requisitions or to view or delete. <clears throat> These are the icons, print, and again, the hovering gives you those tool tips. Notice these are grayed out. Until you select a requisition, those don't come alive. And again, this submit for approval is only viewable if you have the workflow application installed. Otherwise, you wouldn't see that. Um, you can select one or more. So if you select one, you can print. You can select several and do a batch or several to convert. Um, this does all, but you wouldn't probably want that. You can filter by name on the grids or actually on any of these top rows. My system's kind of being slow. So I'm gonna go to where I was gonna go. The advanced query actually helps you filter further down on any of these grids. So let me go into that. As we wait for the blue bar, I hope everybody gets outside today. I think the whole state's supposed to be sunny and beautiful. Or maybe you're watching this outside. It's probably not that warm yet, but okay. Well, what I was going to show you is like, if you don't see the options, this more button shows you options that you could choose so that you can add it to like a column to the grid. So it for instance, I was going to add a column called um, converted because I don't see it on here, but I want to know which requisitions are converted. Oh, maybe it's this check mark. Um, another button under the more button would be 
to have a column on the grid for multi-vendors, which we'll talk about in a few moments, but basically it's one requisition for multiple uh, vendors. Same with the multi-vendor purchase order. Or there's another check mark that you pull in. I mean, there's a lot under the more button once it catches up with me. But one of them is the requisition workflow approval too, which would show you the status. But if you don't see something under the more button, then you would click on the advanced query and that goes even further down. So that $720 on the count, I was gonna show you by the advanced query. I'm gonna refresh this. Okay, I should have did that in the first place. Okay, so the more button. So if I wanted the column converted, or a workflow approval status, or what was the other one I said? Multi-vendor. Right down here. Once I click off that more box, it'll refresh the grid. And now those columns will be on the grid. And this is throughout the application. So you can see the workflow approval status, the converge, converted true or false, and there must be another one down here, multi-vendor. So I'm gonna, you can drag these columns and customize your grid as well. So again, the multi-vendor is also um, true or false. So the advanced query on the grids, again, filters down even further. Because remember, you can, even with these results, you can produce a report, but I want a smaller uh, report of just certain data. So what I'm going to do, what I did was set up my properties and put them over here, and then I saved it. So now when I log in, I can just drop down and choose my thing that I set up. So earlier I had set the function was over here. I drag it over here equals 2,500, which was that account that we were looking at. So we're looking for that 720. Um, and then once I pull up the saved query, apply query, this is where that converted column came comes into play because if the requisition is converted, then it's not going to be in the pre-encumbrance box here. This is only if the pre-encumbrance module is on, but pre-encumbrance is a requisition versus an encumbered purchase order. Let me know if you have any questions on that. So we want all non-encumbered, non-converted requisitions. So we want this to be false. So with this query and this filter, we now know our 720 requisition total. So I just wanted to show you how handy these um, queries that are saved help because now I can run this report and I probably would get rid of some of the columns on there. Like, would I really need the username? I obviously don't need these, but the report will generate what's on your grid. So let's run that. So there's the requisition and the 720, including the columns that we added, converted, the workflow, multi-vendor. If it was a multi-vendor, it would be checkmarked, but it is not.
Okay. So before we actually create a purchase order, we're going to hide the advanced queries to get rid of that top advanced query box. And I could eliminate the filters. Before I click on create, or before we actually create, I want to talk about this requisition number. It is based on the trans uh, transaction configuration and how that is set. This can be entered by the user, like I can enter requisition PZ10, or I can let it auto-populate. Now, remember, we looked at that user, Cafe Secretary. They had the prefix Cafe entered on the user screen. So in that case, since it's on the user screen, when the Cafe Secretary bypasses that rec number, it'll automatically populate cafe and the next incremental number. But let me talk about that requisition number. And that's actually easier to look at in the in the, in the documentation. The rec number can be up to eight characters. Um, part of that eight characters is like a four digit prefix or could be the four digit prefix. So like cafe. Um, I jump ahead of me in my notes. I was going to show you the trans transaction configuration. This is where you start or you uh, set up your like your receipt numbers, your PO numbers. So this is saying that the highest requisition number can go up to all those nines. To, to um, show you actually how this works, we're going to pretend I'm doing this with the requisition number and use this vendor number. So here it's set up to be the highest number of 15334. How did we find that? If you go to the vendor's grid, if you're doing this for Rex, you would go to the Rec grid. This is how I do it. And it's easier to show you than it is to explain in a ticket. So that's why I decided to do this. So these grids can be sorted. So I just click on the top row to find the highest vendor number. And then you see the gaps between well, you can see the gap here, you can see the gap here, but say we want to fill in the gap between um, the 10609 and 15334. That is why we entered the highest number. So the next rec, or in this case, the next vendor that is automatically populated would be 10.06.10 up until this highest number. So again, that's kind of how it's determined on the other highest numbers, but it was easier to show you with that, the vendor. And then I was gonna talk about the prefix on, but I couldn't figure out where that was in the manual. So let me, Go to requisitions. It's 
Sorry for the scrolling. Okay. Let's go into the cafe secretary. I can show you just as fine there. So this, if I, right now it's gonna go cafe and populate to the next number, which I believe is 010. I could also have one CA and how that starts to populate would be the first requisition would be CA. It leaves those two spaces for the prefix and then 0001. That's gonna be your first requisition number. It's almost like it holds those two spaces there and then starts with the first number. So, if you had ABC1, the rep number is going to be ABC10001. Zero, 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 and then the second one converted is going to be 0002, zero, zero, and so forth. Any questions on that? So we're going to leave it as cafe. We're gonna leave it as restricted, which this cafe secretary will now be able to see requisitions from other users. So let's go in, I'll show you what the cafe secretary can now see. Because again, I was in admin and we'll go back to admin, but for the purpose of seeing cafe secretary. When the cafe secretary logs in, this is what they're gonna see. The accounts that they can see are gonna be the only the 006 because of the count filters. Um, limited to requisitions. And you notice, okay, the username. They can see not only the requisitions that the, this cafe secretary entered, but also that page entered for the cafe. So let's create one under the cafe secretary. We're gonna leave this blank so that the next one populated would be, I was wrong, it was 11. So we'll bypass that. It's gonna to default to the current date, but you can change it to any date that is open. A transaction of any kind can only be created or edited in an open period because it changes the books. So if you're gonna change the books in the old days, you would have to erase the books. So you have to actually open the posting period to do it. So, and this reflects the current period. This is also my open posting period. So I'm just gonna bypass that and let it default to the um, current date. Uh, the vendor by default, requisitions and POs do not require a vendor. Not until you go to invoice it in the system, until you go to pay somebody. However, again, there's a rule that can be set up for the district to require them. So if left blank, it's gonna be a non-specific vendor or multi-vendor requisition. There's gonna be multiple vendors paid on this purchase order or this rec that's gonna turn into a purchase order. And there are many reasons why. One could be to assign a vendor that you don't know who you're gonna pay. You're looking on Amazon, but maybe um, you haven't had any luck and it ends up being at Home Depot. So until the purchase is approved, you might not know the vendor. 
Another reason is to have one rec or PO for like one, one PO for all teachers mileage for the year. So as you go to invoice and pay, each one is going to be filled in with a different vendor. So that's another reason why you would leave that empty. But you can drop it down and choose. You can also start typing. Like if I'm looking for the bakery, there's bakery and bakery by Pat. So those are some tips as well. Just a note, vendors can be imported under the core, not by this user, but somebody with permission, but vendors can be imported. And under the chapter for vendors, there is a template spreadsheet that helps you set up if you wanted to import your vendors. Your description, food for March. Delivery by date, that's optional and some may use it, some may not. Delivery address, this is a drop down. And notice there are multiple. Well, if I start typing and just put cotton instead of choosing what's highlighted, it's going to save another delivery address. And where are those coming from? But the core, let me go to that. Actually, I can't until I'm in the admin. So I'll come back to that. That's under core and any variation that the, the user should use the drop down is the key. If not, and they go to start to type one, any variation is saved here. So for instance, I don't see the difference between these two, but for some reason there is a variation. So it saved two delivery addresses. Terms that could be like net, net due in 30 days. You can put an attention mic or whoever you need, cafe department. There is a custom rule that you can set up to require an attention field. This would be checked, not when we're creating one, but afterwards, if you go to view it, like view one of these ones that were already created, if it's been converted, it would be checkmarked upon viewing. If it was created as a template or you want this to be a template, to be like saved for the future use, you can click on that. Templates aren't necessarily converted. They're used to create a new, a new requisition. Excuse me. Pipe, this is an optional text field. And then again, if you had the workflow, a requisition workflow approval working in USAS, then you would see this. If not, um, if you don't have that application enabled, you would not see this. You see the amounts. These are grayed out, so I can't even click on them. As you enter down here, it'll populate. So this will add. 10 packages of hot dogs. And then notice that they only see the four and 500 accounts for 006. Also notice, I don't know if you can see it, but I did 006 dash dash five. And that gets me to 006, skipping this function code or this, yeah, function code, skip into the 500. So that was how I did it because I didn't know my three. You could also do the three dash five. It starts populating as you type. So whether it's right or wrong, I'm picking that account. You can also do splits. 
So for example, you have 10 um, copiers. $10,000. This little button, you can split by quantity. This pops up. So this way I could do five to, and again, I'm in the, um, this example of copiers was not a good one because again, we're in cafe, but I'm gonna use it anyway and just put it to the wrong 006 account. So I could do five to the high school account. I can search for my account as it starts populating. I might be able to do um, a description an XREF, which I'm not sure if that was shown on the accounts yesterday, but I will show you momentarily where that can be find, found. But this can be helpful for, um, that's not working. For users that don't necessarily know the account number or which ones to choose. So we're gonna do, in my example, five at one account, five at another account. So it takes that and splits it. You can also split by price. So if you had one item for $5,000, this icon cups pops up because and it didn't pop up here because you have multiple items, but when you have one, you can split it by price. So again, unit price, um, you can fill in with this account. And then once you save it, I'm just gonna delete that. Now again, we're gonna let this populate. Oh, these buttons up here. If I, before saving, if I click on this and I click save, it's gonna pop up a blank screen so you can continually enter requisitions. If I click on close, as soon as I click on save, this box will close. If I do nothing, it'll just close, it will save this box. You'll still see this box and you'll have to X out of it. I also wanna do something else. There's a Ability to add attachments. Say you had a quote for the copiers or the hot dogs. So you add a file. You can either drop or select. And what I'm choosing is like a sales quote. So I have a blank quote. And then adds it down here, which can be downloaded if you need to print it. It can be deleted if it's the wrong one, but it, it's attached. So I'm not, oh, and again, I'll just show you this. This will not be available if you don't have the requisition workflow uh, application installed, but it would show you the steps, like the secretary submitted it to the treasurer and the treasurer approved it. So I'm not picking any, and I'll show you me what I mean by you have to X out. Once you save it, it does save and it does auto populate to the cafe 011, like we expected. It shows the correct split by quantity, um, no vendor. And to get out of this screen, to create another one, you would have to, or to clone, you would have to X out. Or I can click close 
hit save and it closes automatically. Uh, the grid options are, I mean, if you choose, you can print one or multiple. Same with convert, one or multiple. And we'll talk about the conversion process in a minute when we're talking about purchase orders. If you need to edit, you would um, use the little pencil icon. Only unconverted. So this converted column, false. Only unconverted in an open period can be um, edited. I showed you the clone, the delete. Again, you can delete it. I think I have July open in this database. So I was going to do that, but it will let me because I know I have that posting period open. And then this button. Well, let me go back to the admin. I'm going to go back to the admin user. You know how we added the multi-vendor, the converted. So say I wanted to just like wipe this grid clean, you would reset this grid with this button. Reset to the default columns. As it slowly does it. All right, so. How do you find requisitions? that are ready to be converted so that you can go to the next process of purchase orders. But you can do that here from the grid, converted, false. Um, again, you can use the advanced query as well. And for purposes of training, I, again, created them saved them and now I can just easily go in here and find well first well let's let's look at Rex with attachments so the property name over here that I found was file name and I drag it over here file name is that file that we saved and attached to the requisition so if that's not empty true once we apply this query the grid, these are all the refs that have attachments. Now you have to go in to get that attachment at this current time, but at least you can find the refs with attachments. If you wanted requisitions that are not converted, but have attachments, you would enter false. These are the open requisitions. And again, if I was a user, I would make my life easy. Rex approved to be converted and with an attachment. So I did converted equals true. I must have set this up for that workflow application, um, but that's not necessary in us without that application. And then the file name contains a file and is not empty. So there is, there are those requisitions. So the query can be very handy. If I wanted to clear, if I wanted to find, I just, oh, multi vendor equals true. This is how I would save it. Once I set it up, and I'm just going to make a simple one, I would just um, enter a name, click save. It shows that it was saved. And then now it's a choice here. So anytime I go in there, it's going to pop up what I created, which is so nice. And again, 
once you, um, like this one, recs to be converted with attachments, I can create a report from the grid's results. So whatever's on the grid, here's my report. If I needed a paper copy, there are my requisitions. And you see they're not converted. Any questions on that? There are also other ways to get um, reports under this help button. There's that public, oops, public USAS report library that you click on. These are different reports that other users have shared or created. Um, it gives you the report definition that you would take and import it into the report manager here. And it gives you the description, but here's an example. So this requisition report will look like this with the remaining balance. If I, here's a requisitions not converted attachments. And it gives you the name of the attachment as well. So that's another option. And that again is under the public, oops, I clicked on something, shared reports library. The other place that you can, um, it's under the report manager. We do have, so those other reports in this, you would download this definition, whatever you're gonna use, click on it and download it and then you would import it if you wanted that report. You would choose it wherever you saved it and create it. So some of these were like created like that. Um, there are requisition detail and summary, summary reports. There's the summary, there's the detail that you can generate. And because these are transaction-based, let me open one up. You, you don't have to have an open period. You can, like if you wanted to go all the way back to July, I don't know if I have any in here. You can, because this is based on transactions. So I don't have to open up the period of July to get this data like the cash summary, I would have to at least make it current. So this is the detail report from July. So there's an exam example of the template report that's also available. All right, so any questions on requisitions so far? The next step is, um, we know which recs need to be converted. We know which ones have attachments. So we're ready to select the requisitions to be converted. So again, I can choose one or I can choose more. The order that I pick, converted false, is gonna be the order that determines the PO number. So if I pick Pepsi first and then auditing, it's gonna do this PO and then that PO second. So let's convert those. This pop-up comes up. You can pick a date if you want, or you can just let it default to today. This starting PO number, and again, on that transaction configuration, you can, the district can set the highest PO number so it wouldn't go beyond that. Based on that, the next PO number will be um, 
updated if you leave it blank. So I'm going to leave it both of these blank and it's going to default to today and um, assign the PO number. So ignore the red. I forgot, but this is a workflow database. So it's got to go through the approval stage, but it gives you the warnings and the negative balance account for that account. All right, so the next step is the confirmation from the treasurer that there are monies to cover the re requisition and that's the conversion process. So again, the variables are different for each district versus, I mean, for like roles, the count filters, the rules. And if you go under the uh, documentation under rules, you'll see non-mandatory rules for purchase orders as well as possibly custom rules that are available to use. So those can all be different. By default, a purchase order does not need a vendor. Again, that can be later assigned when invoiced. And the number of items on the purchase order is not limited. However, keep in mind, if you have like 300 lines on a purchase order, it may slow down performance if it's huge. I'm not sure, but just to heed that warning. Um, this is the actual certification on the purchase order where the, you get the treasure signature that I hear certified, blah, blah, blah. So I just wanted to show you that let's go into the system under purchase orders. And the grids are going to all look kind of the same. You're going to be able to have a create button. You're going to have a view button. You're going to have tool tips. You have the ability to import purchase orders. Um, we have a new icon on this grid and it looks like a little invoice, a little paper. So you can invoice from the purchase order grid. Um, that's about it as far as the new stuff on here. So to create a purchase order, besides importing purchase orders on a spreadsheet, this is what it would look like. I am, oh, let me just show you that delivery address. That is under core. Remember I said any delivery or any variation of, of what we enter is set up and I set up cotton without picking this one. So now it has two. You can have them both active, but so the user doesn't see the wrong one, you would uncheck that. So the next time the cafe secretary the first time the cafe secretary may see both, but you would instruct them to pick the right one. And then the next time it should default to the right one after the right one is selected. Okay, so when you're creating a purchase order, it's gonna look the same as if I view one. So I'm gonna view one and talk about the dates on the purchase order itself. Oops. This can make it bigger, just so you know. And so the fields, the date on the top here is the date when it was entered or converted. And then this has a vendor, the description. It's kind of just like the requisition screen. The delivered by date, 
Remember that was optional. So there's nothing on this one. This date is the date it was created. The posted date is often used with the third party application. So this will be automatically populated to the created date um, for any new purchase orders. And then if the purchase order was modified or amended, <clears throat> this would be check marked with a new modification date. And the source, where's the source right here? That's often the requisition number that comes from, um, that's the requisition number, sorry. So you'll see that on the audit trail as the source. Okay. If the purchase order is still invoiceable, I mean, there is a column here, you could put true, but you'll, if it's still invoiceable, you'll see that icon. If it's not invoiceable, you won't see it. It won't be an option to invoice it. And you might see this then and now column. It, I'm not sure if it's a, I think it's a pulled in column from the more button, but what is that? I am gonna actually go to the PowerPoint and pull it up. So basically what this is saying is a purchase order must be in place before something is spent. And it's because of the budget is approved for those monies. So if it's not done in correct order, but the treasurer can still certify that the money was there at the time of the order or then and complete that certification now that there are sufficient funds for that purchase, then it becomes a then and now. So for instance, the teacher um, ordered the costumes for the play and then next week put in the request requisition for the purchase order. Now the purchase order is dated next week, but the order and the goods were ordered this week. That's a then and now situation because the purchase order should have been done first. Requisition or purchase order should have been done first. So that is what that column could inform you. It will be automatically checked. Let me pull up one. If it is a then and now purchase order. So let's view this purchase order. So it's automatically checked because of that. So is there a report that I can get for a then and now? You can get it from this grid because you have the then and now, I would filter it probably to true. Now, this is only pulling it from that check mark though on the PO. So using my example of um, the costumes ordered today, but the purchase order and requisition was approved next week, but also on that purchase order was um, the programs for the play. Well, those haven't been ordered. So those aren't actually a then and now situation or a confirming. However, because this is on a check mark on the purchase order, the whole purchase order is marked or flagged as a then and now. I think in districts, when that invoice reflects that the costumes were ordered prior to the PO, they stamp the invoice with that saying that I showed you. And then the treasurer would sign it depending on their procedures and policies. But say those programs that were ordered after the purchase order was converted, that would nece not necessarily have that stamp on that invoice 
because it has the stamp on the purchase order, if that makes sense. And if not, please, please ask. Because if you're wondering, somebody else is wondering too. Okay, so purchase orders. Those can be imported. Uh, for the lack of timing, I don't want to take up all your time. Let me just show you the spreadsheet. In the documentation, there's the import criteria with all the formats, as well as this template with it formatted for you. So for instance, this top row. This is the importing ability does have the ability to use splits. Um, notice this item number one and two. That's a two line purchase order. Item number one, item number two. This is a one line purchase order. I'm sorry, oh, two line, one here, one there. But this is a one line purchase order. And then this one is a four line. But this first line is split into two accounts. So that has the ability, even importing a purchase order, CSV file to split the accounts and then just import it. And you would just do this, choose the file and load it. You'll get a pop-up message whether or not it worked um, or the error. I believe it's USAS load error report and you open it up to find what error it is. Sometimes it's just the formatting. So on a purchase order, um, you have the ability to edit when a new PO hasn't been mailed and it's technically still sitting on your desk. So this OASBO purchase order was just made two days ago and I do have it on my desk. I have to change the address or something on it. So I do have the ability, well, no, I don't. <laughs> um, so, I pulled up the wrong one. So this purchase order was still two days ago. If I go into edit, I have these options, amend or edit. Again, edit is when it's still sitting on your desk and it hasn't been mailed to the vendor. And it must be in an open period. And I know currently it's March and it's the period that I've been posting transactions all month. So it's open. The PO amend button are for changes after the PO has been sent to the vendor. So let's think about that. It's already been sent to the ven vendor. So you would not be able to change the vendor name on the purchase order. It's already been sent to the vendor. So you would not be able to change the PO date or the item items. Let me go into the edit just to show you the edit. The edit, you can change any of these because it's still sitting on your desk. But one that is not editable and only amendable I thought I, let's see. Maybe it's 57. Yeah, I had a typo in my notes. So this one is not editable because it, it's obviously sitting on the vendor's desk, not mine because it was mailed back in February. So you can only amend it. Now, I think you can you can choose this on the grid and click the amend or the edit and then it'll pop up. But if we click amend, notice what I said, you can't change the PO, the date, the vendor because it's on their desk and you can't change these items. However, what you can do is copy this line, see how those pop up. It'll populate the next line 
because I want two cases of Diet Pepsi. And then I could cancel this line. Say I wanted this to go to a different account. So I corrected the quantity, I corrected the account, but I'm gonna cancel this line. I can't change this because it's not an open period. <laughs> okay, but that's how you would amend it. You would cancel the original line and well, you would copy the line and cancel the original one. You also have the ability to repair a purchase order. Now, this is helpful when, this is in the next step, but these payables are sitting out here for the vendor BGSU. However, even though I just did five invoices for BGSU, the purchase order shouldn't be BGSU, it should be computer, computer world. So, a those invoices sitting in payables. So back on the purchase order grid, if I pull up that PO, and view it, I can repair. This gives you the ability to repair the account, the vendor, or the date. I'm going to do the vendor, and I'm gonna, instead of BGSU, it should have been Computer World. Once I click Update, it will update the purchase order, but it will also update those invoices under Payables. So that's what's nice about PO repair. It, as long as it's not paid, it'll update what's in the payable. So once I click update, it will give me a, re, a result report showing me what was updated. There's my warnings. Here's my change result. This PO, this invoice and payable was changed from BGSU to Computer World. If I wanted to print it, I could and I probably would attach it to the physical purchase order. But when I'm done, I could close it. And you can see it's been updated. And let me go into the payables and show you that it, that's been updated too. There's no BGSU on here. Any questions on that? We do have a canned purchase order report, which off is much more efficient than the template reports. You have different parameters that you can choose from, different formats that you can um, generate. You can do all outstanding or invoicing. Uh, yeah, invoiceable. There are some under the um, public use as Library, like somebody created a PO detail by date. One did a PO detail by OPU of the account code. There's one by Fund Special Cost Center. So the variations are out there. Let me show you. With the example and the report definition. So basically, if you wanted to Oh, I like this. You download it. And then in your dumb in your instance, you would in under the report manager, import the report, name your report. It's gonna try to find that one that I picked which I'm not sure where it went, but you would pick your report and you, you could um, have it on the report manager. 
Okay, so those are purchase orders. We've gone from requisitions to purchase orders, and now it's time to invoice. You can invoice a purchase order from the purchase order um, grid. And what an invoice is, is really the confirmation to the vendor that, yeah, the school district received those goods. And now the district is preparing it for payment. So in the system, in USAS, you actually have to create an invoice. So you can invoice it by clicking on here. You can also, you would just enter the invoice number and date and such. You can also go under the AP invoice screen, click create. And this way you would have to know the purchase order. But once you do, it would open up that same screen where you would enter the invoice number and the invoice date. Um, when you're creating a AP invoice, it's got to be in an open period. So for instance, I just received an invoice that's, um, it's going to default in the system as today's date, but the actual invoice is February. So let me pull up the PowerPoint and I'll just show you the dates. So, and actually it might be better to go in the system, I apologize. So let's look at this invoice. This date, it'll default to the current date. So this is when the user entered this invoice. If the vendor's invoice is actually dated March 29th, you could enter it here because the vendor's invoice was really dated March 29th, but the system's going to use the current date. Uh, the receive date is when you actually receive the items and the user would enter that. Let me open that. And the payment due date is optional, but you can use the calendar if you need to. So those are the dates. I'm going to pull up another purchase order. Oh, eight. Okay, so this purchase order, that's the invoice number, invoice date. Down here, I have sorry about that. I think I meant to pick. Yeah, I was gonna show you this invoice that's already created. All right, so this is the invoice that's already created, Baker 001. It was created um, on 3.15, dated for 3.15. I have a couple other, let me. This invoice, line one was filled entirely. That's one status, a full, is used um, to fill all the items. All the items on that purchase order or that line have been received and is going to be paid in full. A partial is when you only receive partial um, of the order and you can flag it as partial. If you're only getting um, three muffins for mom, you could cancel two and have a cancel partial or a cancel full if you're not getting any of them. So those statuses would change on that. Um, 
when you're, here's another variable, when you have the class, the inventory classic integration configuration set up and configured to work with inventory, when you have the, let me go to the slide. When you have the classic configuration set up with this check mark automatic, and that's automatically checked, whenever you're invoicing a, an account with a 600 object code, it's going to automatically check mark the inventory item if it's invoiced in full. But this amount of this invoice in full was 6,500. Say you went to invoice it partially for 4,000. If, if it was 4,000 and partial, the user would have to check mark it to be an inventory item. Now, when that configuration is not automatically or the automatic checkbox is not check marked, the, oops, the user is going to have to automatically check mark that when invoicing. So this is the bottom of the invoice. You're filling it partially for 4,000 and the user would have to check mark it so that it integrates with the inventory system. I think I have this purchase order. It must have been going to create an invoice for this purchase order and show you that invoice. See that inventory item there? Um, invoice number, today's date. I actually got it on the 29th of February. If I fill it in entirely because it meets that threshold and it because it was check marked automatically it's going to populate that check mark if it was not check marked to be fill automatically the user is going to have to sorry physically check mark it and what I was saying before is if I only filled this item, even though it qualifies for uh, inventory item, but if I only do it partially for 4,000, here's my statuses that I have options to choose. I'm gonna, because it's not filled in, in full, the user is still gonna have to check mark that. Click save. Now that invoice for do run textiles is going to be under the payables. So there's the do run textiles, which we're going to talk about the payables in just a moment. So how do you determine how or what invoices are marked for inventory? And you can do that by the grid. So... I actually made an advanced query for this. I love these advanced queries. And what I did was inventory item over here, and you'll see it here, even though I spelled that wrong. Inventory item from here to here equals true. Once I hit apply, there's my inventory purchase orders invoices. There's the do run textiles. The other one, uh, the other way, there is a report in the public USAS report library that can be used to find the inventory pending items. And you would import that into the report manager and run it by choosing the different dates, whether you want the report to be by invoice date or the receipt date. Okay, so... I'm going a little bit longer than I thought I would, but we're on the next stage. Oh, I, I did want to mention 
that you do also have the ability to import accounts payable invoices. Excuse me. Um, I believe I had a sample. There's the criteria link. There's the spreadsheet link. And here's a, excuse me, a sample of the CSV file with the invoice number and the required fields with the different statuses, different dates, and so forth. And you would import that with the import button. So now once that you have the um, AP invoices created, they show up in the payables. Payables are invoices received from the vendor. They're owed, they're entered, but they're not paid yet. So you can select payables by vendor. I like seeing the detail because I'll show you in a minute. You can see all the invoices for a computer world or all the invoices for this electronic payment versus one lump sum of the check that you could create. So what you would do, I'm gonna, you can select all, you can select one. I'm gonna choose all the computer worlds post the selected, it pops up with the summary. I have five invoices with that amount. I can verify it with my physical invoices. I choose the date. I might wanna pick it for Friday. I might wanna date it for today. You can choose it with this. The grouping options is by vendor or invoice. So, um, the user has that, and then you can choose your bank, right? In this demo, I only have one bank set up. If I don't like this, I can return to the payable grid, but in this case, I wanna post to create the disbursement. There's my post conversion. Now, if I want to continue to print the disbursement, that's going to print the actual check. So I'm going to click continue to print. It's going to take me to the disbursement grid. Now, I'll say um, I can come in here Friday to the disbursement grid and just pick this too. I don't have to print it at that time. I could just come in here and choose this. So I would choose one or all, generate print file. Um, it refers to that transaction configuration where the highest check number is recorded here. So if I leave this blank, it will automatically populate for the next number below that number. You have your sorting options of by pay name, vendor name, vendor number, payable entry date. Um, the electronic checks. Now, electronic checks are noted by an electronic vendor. So we did have uh, under the payables, I had one electronic vendor that's noted under the vendor's record. Here, if you want those checks, electronic checks to be actually printed, an electronic check is like a virtual check, an ACH or something. But some districts choose to have these printed. And if you do, you have to check mark these so, so that it would print. This XML is often used with third party printing abilities. This is the PDF form that you could just print what the check looks like. Here's what the check looks like in PDF form. If I wanted to customize that, as well as customizing a purchase order, requisition, any PDF file, you can customize. And I don't have time to show you um, 
how to customize it. But once you click on this, if you have it saved as a form under the report manager, oh, I don't have a disbursement. It would show here, it would have default and then the customized disbursement form. So I created that check. Um, if I go, it was for Computer World. If I go to Payables, Computer World is no longer there. If I go to the purchase order grid, It is no longer invoiceable, false, because eight, the PO total has been paid. So, and just a note that you can see that, that it's no longer invoiceable by here too, because the icon is not fillable. And you can see the total paid and the details. So once a disbursement is actually posted and expended on the expenditure account, the current encumbrances decreases because it was paid and the amount expended increases on the accounts. So that is what Amanda was talking about with the accounts and the effects yesterday. So I know I jumped around and I forgot to show you the customized forms. I saved it for the disbursement, but I didn't have a customized disbursement. So I know I have one for a purchase order. Say for instance, I wanted my purchase order to have this stamp on it or the school logo. If you go into the appendix, the a documentation appendix under useful procedures, there is a custom form for printing any PDF transaction. So there's a template for the AR billing, the receipt, the disbursement. I just didn't have one set up or the purchase order. So what you do here is you take that and you customize it with that logo. Then under the report manager, you would create a form with this button. Rename it, describe it. A tag would be like form. This would be purchase order because we're importing a purchase order PDF form and then you would select your form. So then you can easily uh, see that I have a reduction of expenditure with the logo, a purchase order with the logo. So once that's created under the report manager, now when I go to print the purchase order, PDF form, and again, this works with any PDF, When I go to choose the PDF, I have more options. I have the default and I have the PO with the logo. So if you need any help customizing that, just send in a ticket. But his, this is what the PO would look like in my very simple example. So we're almost done, um, probably a few more minutes. I wanted to talk about um, the other disbursement options, as well as give you guys an option to ask any questions. It's been a pretty quiet group today. Once you have your disbursements created, mistakes happen and you can void um, an outstanding check. So say this is the wrong, I need to void this check. So you notice the options are grayed out at the top, but as soon as I select this check, I have that void option. 
a void date comes up. Now the void date must be in an open period. I can't um, post this back in July if the posting period is not open in July. This little check mark, void invoice items. By default, that's going to come in check marked. What that means is it's going to cancel the associated invoice items. So on that computer world um, check, I had five invoices. If I leave that checked by default, those invoices are going to be canceled or voided. So since those are voided, it opens up the items on the purchase orders and the items can be re-invoiced if needed. If I uncheck that, the five invoices on the computer world disbursement will not be voided. Say you just need to update because you forgot to add the shipping cost at the bottom of the invoice, you just did the gross of the items and forgot the shipping. So you really don't want to re-enter that invoice. You don't want to avoid that invoice. You just want to edit the invoice. So uncheck that, confirm. Those invoices are still going to be out there. It gives you a confirmation that it was voided. Let's go to the AP invoice. There's my invoices. I can delete them here if needed, or I can edit it. Say this was really supposed to be 4801. Because, so I can edit under the AP invoice as needed or delete, say this one wasn't supposed to be included. But whether or not I edit it, they are the computer world. When you leave that box unchecked, the invoices are going to go back to the payables and can be edited under the AP invoices. So you can see... I still have all those other four invoices entered. I don't have to re-enter them. I just had to update this one. So now I can select them and post a new check again. Now, once I do this, I will not be able to unvoid this check. And it's because I'm repaying it. So I'm not gonna do that yet because I wanna show you how to unvoid. Um, as long as the void date is in an open period and the void date is not before 2024. And that's kind of like, um, it's like the middle of January. It was whenever the release version 2024.0.0 was released. Any voids prior to that release will, will not be able to be unvoided. And it's because we didn't track what's needed to tra be tracked on the invoice to be unvoided. So if... If I was going to repay those invoices to Computer World, I would not be able to unvoid it if I deleted those AP invoices or if I repaid those invoices. So let's find a void, this Computer World. I check mark it, my options come alive or darken. If I select unvoid and select confirm, It'll give me a message that it cannot because it's been paid. And why? Because it's still in the payables. 
and it's been paid. So there are some situations where you can unvoid a disbursements um, if needed. Let's see. The reports for disbursements, again, you can create one from the grid. There are disbursement detail canned report, which is faster than the template detail report and the summary report. I believe there are some options in the public USAS report library where I think there was one that was sorted by type. So you could have a disbursement detail report by the accounts payable checks only or the accounts or the payroll checks only. So there's options there as well. So wrapping up, the other quick things that you could do with disbursements is if you need to change the check number, say I was supposed to use check number 123 and I accidentally put 1123. If I need to change that so that your check numbers are in sequence, there is an option to resequence. And what you would do is enter um, yeah, pick one with a check. You would enter the original check number, starting and end. If you have a batch, it would be different. If you only have one, it would be the same and your new check number. And then you would post and you would get your message that it's been resequenced. Another thing you can do from this grid is any outstanding status. <clears throat> You have the ability to reconcile these checks, enter a reconciliation date and click reconcile or cancel. For those that are reconciled like this one, you have the ability to unreconcile if needed. And then that would put it back to an outstanding status. And then there's also the ability to auto reconcile and that's using the bank file. Um, I'm not gonna show you that because I don't have a bank file, but just know that it's available. Okay, so I apologize, we went over a little bit. That's everything you need to know on the expenditure process from the requisition to the purchase order to the AP invoice, which creates the payable which can be turned into a disbursement. If you have any questions, um, let me know or put in a ticket. I appreciate your attendance. And tomorrow we will be reviewing the receipt process in USAS, which includes the receipt processing, the refund processing, and a little bit just to know a little bit about the accounts receivable uh, module in USAS. All right, so. All right, everybody enjoy the nice sunny day and have a great day. Thanks everybody for joining.